from the very beginning of time, we've seen people sit around campfires and share stories, sit around dining room tables and share stories. Um, it is, for my money, the most effective way to build connection and community. Everybody in this room has probably been in a business meeting or a classroom where PowerPoint presentations roll like train wheels. You are gonna forget every PowerPoint you've ever seen, but I guarantee you that someone who stands and tells a story, you will remember it. I just thought I would share a tiny, tiny little story from my life as it intersected here in Clifton Forge. And then we have a number of folks who volunteered to tell stories and share, share themselves with us in that format. Um, it was 1981. It was a beautiful October morning. The mountains were all aflame. They were orange, red, yellow. It was a stunning day. My family and I were driving down to look at moving to Clifton Forge and the Allegheny Highlands. And I remember driving down on 64, Interstate 64, we crossed the uh, state line and we got into Virginia, Allegheny County, and I said, we have hit the jackpot. My feelings about this town have not changed. And I think that those of you who have lived here for a while or who have made your home here from somewhere else probably share that feeling. Then when we got into Clifton Forge and I saw for the first time the sign that said, Clifton Forge, busy, scenic, and friendly. I said again, we have hit the jackpot. So I'm so glad you all are here today. This is the first time that the What's Your Story project has been here at the theater. Um, I hope that next year we'll have five times this many people. But we are so happy that you're here today and that you've joined us to share some of our stories. Again, at the risk of repeating myself, story is the most effective way to build bridges, to make friends, and build community. So I'd like to introduce you to Gail Hillert, who is part of the What's Your Story Committee. And she's going to share a really interesting story about the power of story itself. Well, I made the first turtle I got up on stage. So I um, volunteer for the theater. I was involved in the theater's restoration. This theater, in, in 2015, we undertook the restoration of the theater after raising $6.9 million. So if you have not been in this theater, I encourage you to walk through the theater and there's a self-guided tour pamphlet. So that's my commercial. Um, be, being a part of What's Your Story has given me new insight into people and into friendships and to just how powerful story can be, as Joan mentioned. So I was very happy to be able to hook up with Joan, who spearheaded this project, and our first book was on the Sonic Theater. Unfortunately, when people took over the theater and we've been through a series of owners, um, they would discard what the people did before, so we didn't have a whole lot of history. Not a lot of written history, but through this book that we were able to pull together, we have now oral history. We interviewed 20-something people, and they were from ages 11 to 99. And some of them are no longer with us, so we were so happy to be able to capture their stories while we could. But I want to tell you about a very uh, person, a person that has been extremely interesting to interview, um, I met him through the phone. Uh, he heard about the project. He grew up in Clifton Forge, and he got, he actually contacted us and said, well, it just so happens we're doing a, a story, a book of stories about Clifton Forge, and we want to hear your story about the theater. That has begun a three, four year friendship. And he is Pastor Ralph Unruh. He is now in his 80s. He grew up here, as I said, and he started working for the theater when he was 13 years old. And boy, did he have stories. <laughs> he left Clifton Forge, did not graduate from high school, joined the service, and was in the service for quite a while, and then became a pastor. So he lives in Pennsylvania now. So everything that we did was long distance. 
until he convinced his family to bring him here to see the restoration. So um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about him first before I, I'm going to paraphrase actually his story. So he's the last one in our book and he took up several pages, but believe me, he could have taken the whole book. And he's also in the CNO book too, I think, as well. But um, this is what the mission of this theater is about. It's not a theater, just a theater. It is also a community center. And through the arts, we feel like people can learn to find themselves, to be productive, and that type of thing. So this is what he said. Uh, he started working when, I, when he was 13. When I got to the theater, there wasn't anybody saying, you won't amount to a hill of beans. And I heard that the whole time I was growing up. The theater gave me a sense of what was outside of Clifton Forge. It let me know what was possible. Growing up off and on in the Masonic was an education that I can never forget. So that, in his words, is what we try to do in this theater. And I'm going to tell you a really quick story. He, had, he met Lash LaRue, who some of you may know, he's the guy that taught Harrison Ford how to use the whip. And he was in a bunch of movies, and he came here several times. One of the precious findings that we did have is a 1940s poster of him that your husband framed for us. He kind of restored it, and it's upstairs on an easel. But um, Lash LaRue asked him to hold his horses around his farm. And he was really thrilled about that. But one of the things that he didn't know was going to happen was uh, he was working with Lash LaRue, you know, finding things and going and get, getting things. And he gave him a nickel and he said, now I want you to go around and get a Coke and make sure that it's a Coke bottle and that the cap is on top, tight. And he said, okay. So then he got back on stage and Lash LaRue told the audience, this young man doesn't know what I'm going to do with him right now. So I just want you to hold that Coke bottle out like that. And Lash got his whip, and he took the top of the Coke bottle off while, while Pastor Unruh was holding it. And um, he'll never forget that. And he said, I wish I'd picked up the Coke bottle top and kept it from him. But then um, uh, he has a message for us, and I think that's why Joan decided to put him at the end of the book, because it's a message for all of us, and it's about preservation. And that is also one of our um, favorite words and the favorite things that we do in our whole plan for this theater is preservation. So he says, little towns like Clifton Forge are the towns that Rockwell painted. They aren't supposed to end up empty. If I told you what I thought about the town for letting that Masonic get in the condition it did, I'd never be able to make a trip down there again before I died. To put it in plain terms, and I'm not an educated man, I think it's a crying shame that the theater just went downhill. But when I went on the computer the other night and looked up Clifton Forge and saw the parades they had there in 2015, I wouldn't recognize it as the same town. For too many years, the coal trains puffed their way by the basement of Masonic Theater, right outside this window here. For too many years, the theater was left on the slag heap until somebody got foresight to say, here's a treasure we're saving. To see this theater, I just can't believe it. I'll put it this way, you got a second chance. The Titanic went down and it didn't get a second chance, but the Masonic Theater has come back from the ashes. And every time I walk into that theater, I think into this theater, I think about Pastor Enno and the lessons that he gave us through his stories. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bishop Alfred Deering, known to many as Mustard, and he participated in the volume about Green Pastures, which is a park that is hopefully going to be brought back to its former glory. Um, but Bishop Deering is going to share a story that ties in with this area, and it's about his trip through discovering his ancestry in Virginia. And I'll leave it at that because it's fascinating and I think he'll do a wonderful justice. So thank you for speaking with us today. First, I must say praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. I don't do anything without giving him the glory first. Um, I know my time is limited, so I'm going to rush through this. But first, I'll tell you who I am. My name is Bishop Alfred Mustard Deering. I am the host of Precious Memories Gospel Hour 
and I'm also the pastor of Kai, Come As You Are Community Ministry. Now, when I first moved here in 1994, I came from Washington, D.C., in which my wife was born and raised right here in Clifton Forge. I would have never known anything about Clifton Forge, I don't think, it had not been for my wife. Thank God for her. Um, but um, as, you know, moving into a town where it was really unfamiliar to me, I had to get out of the fast lane and get into the slow lane because just, just the way it was. But thank God I was able to adjust. Now, um, going back to, um, well, why I am brought here today to show you, because I did, I'm uh, thinking about the Masonic Theater also. Um, I did have the privilege of presenting the original drifters, Bill Pinkney and the original drifters. Um, I brought them here twice through different means, but I got them here to this theater. I brought several other um, um, bands or groups or whatever. I brought them here in various ways. The amphitheater, here in the theater before restoration. I remember the day when about three groups came in and it was so cold. <laughs> the people had to have blankets, but they stayed throughout the show and they really enjoyed it. So this beautiful, magnificent theater has come a long ways and it's the state of the arts, believe me. And I, I really appreciate to be able to be right here in your presence. Now, what happened? Around 2000, um, I was searching for relatives. My father was born in Alta Vista, Virginia, Gretna, down in that area. And he was the baby of 25 children. So I went on Ancestry.com, <coughs> excuse me please, I went on Ancestry.com and I was searching for relatives of Handy Deering, in which was my grandfather. Well, in my search, I came up with nothing. About eight, nine years later, this lady, she contacted me from Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah. She was a Mormon, she is a Mormon. And she was searching for her relatives in which were walkers related to Deerings. Now, this is on the white side, all right? <laughs> so, after, her search, she came up with some information that she called me. She said, I think that we're related. I paused for a minute. <laughs> uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, from Virginia. <laughs> I couldn't see it. Uh, black to white, I couldn't see it. She said, my great-grandmother, my great-great-grandmother and your great-great-grandfather, sister and brothers, and I said, oh, okay. So what we did, we went to this place in Alta Vista. It's a museum. And it's called Avoca. Now the museum is on a plantation where my grandfather and my great-grandfather, Sandy Deering, were slaves on. It was owned by General James Deering and his wife, Anna Deering, in which um, she was the daughter to um, Charles Lynch. 
in which Charles Lynch's brother John Lynch, I think, or James Lynch, I think his name is, he was like a judge at that time. And a lot of people mistake the word lynching for black people being hung. But it was not only black people going through the torture during those days, it was black and white. Because if you did not agree with this lynch, he didn't care who you were. So, and y'all can read the story, you can pull it up. Here's all the, my pictures where I was setting on history. I sat on the couch of General James Deary, news in advance, took a picture of it, and they blew it up. Uh, the um, um, Alta Vista Journal did the same. I had uh, news, uh, the news photographer, I mean, the cameras from WRIC, they came out and they interviewed me. I had WETA, they interviewed me. I, um, oh, it's also another write up about it, and I can't think of it. Can you remember the name of it? Uh, the newspaper. Oh, USA Today. USA Today, I'm sorry. USA Today. You have to excuse me. But I, I, I'm saying is that this is history going on. Now, we've already had one family reunion where the descendants of the slaves and the descendants of the slave owners have come together. That was last year. We're not doing anything this year, but next year we will have another one. We're working on that now. So, also I have a picture hanging in the museum. There, my, this, this picture right here is in the museum. So, that is history alone. Now, I'm proud to say that me being living here in Clifton Forge, I'm going to say being from Clifton Forge, I might as well say I have 25 years. I, I bought a mausoleum over there, so I'm here to stay. <laughs> uh, uh, it's history being made, not only for my grandchildren and great-grandchildren and those who come if the world is still standing, Yours also. Yours also. Now, I would love to invite anybody down when we have our next reunion to come just to see how people can get along. How love can be shared throughout all. I know it's somebody in here, if not everybody, has gone through a cycle in life that was uncomfortable. Definitely myself. But, on the other hand, if we share love, it overrules all of that. In the closing, if you will go um, and pull up, um, well, you have to pull up, Avoca, Avoca Museum, A-V-O-C-A, museum, I think dot com, and you can pull that up, look on the Alfred Deary, you can pull Alfred Deering up in there, and it gives you all of this. All of this information, well not that so much, as much as this. All of this information as to what I have done to be a part of history being made in this world. Okay? So, um, I could go on and on, but I'm, I don't think it's necessary. And I do believe that um, it will help someone, one day, somewhere, and I pray to that. Thank God for you, and thank God for being God. So, on my hands and knees, I beg Dr. Jack Backles, retired president of Dabney S. Lancaster Community College, to come and share a story. Would you do that, Dr. Backles? 
my background is totally uh, probably something that would uh, lead to where, we, where I'm thinking about. <coughs> I, uh, all four of my grandparents come to, came to this country in the eight in 1895. Uh, my parents uh, were the first born and uh, they came from a family of eight and four uh, of the children. Incidentally, uh, their, all of those children went, did post-secondary education. Uh, over half of them uh, got the baccalaureate. There was, there, there's at least two, uh, I, no, I don't think that any of them got into beyond baccalaureates, but most of them had baccalaureates, so they had at least one or two years. So therefore, the, my background was really, if you think about it, uh, educationally bound. But when I, so I graduated in 48. Now, the class of 48, if you think about it, 47 from 48 are really lost children because uh, we all sat through World War II, but we didn't, uh, we, the war was over before we graduated from high school. Uh, and then uh, when we went, graduated from high school, when you're looking to go to college, the college is flooded, absolutely flooded with vet veterans. You never saw so many veterans as you <laughs> I mean, everybody, everyone was a veteran. Uh, so much that every college in the, in the country was blowing completely out of port. They couldn't, they couldn't take them. They, they, they had too many people. Uh, and then along, uh, along came Korea, and if you were in college, you, you, could, you wouldn't didn't have to go, but if, if, you, uh, <laughs> if you didn't go to college, you would be, we were drafted and were part of, part of the thing. Therefore, every male every, that I know, everybody that I ever grew, grew up with, we were all veterans. We all became veterans. But we weren't, we were the leftover veterans because we became, well, went with, went with, uh, went into Korea. Uh, probably this led to the problem, the, the problem of community colleges. And uh, that was fundamental. Uh, as a result of which, if, when you put this all together, they were running out of uh, college uh, presidents, college teachers, college everything, and that really faded all the way down into the Dabney Lancaster Community College because of the overflow of the, the, of the children of the World War II, and then you throw in you threw in uh, Korea, you had all of these young people going to college. Uh, there was a couple places that tried things. They tried, tried three out there in Pasadena, California. Uh, they, they went with a 644. Now think of that. Uh, 644, 6th grade, 10th grade, and 14th grade. <laughs> and there were a number of those high schools that established, uh, particularly in well, Pasadena, is actually it was really part of was was a biggie because uh, they had uh, had a uh, they won six four four for a number of years, and if you always look pay attention, you will see that the, that the current capital, the uh, the queen of the thing, was a member of the uh, community college site now. They, they couldn't, frankly, they couldn't go 6-4-4 four, four because nobody would play their football team, you know? Uh, because if you went all the way through their public schools, 
you'd have two years of college. That in, in, in Chicago, uh, around Chicago University, they both jumped into the 644, but then it went well apart. So all of this stuff came together uh, for the community college movement. And the community college movement really came uh, for me uh, or the after me. Uh, and that's why all of a sudden we had community colleges. Uh, in college, in Kellogg, Kellogg University, Kellogg's, well, we all know that we, we, we eat the stuff every Sunday morning. In the, uh, along about 60, there was a total flood of the students. Uh, and because everybody all of a sudden decided they had to go to college. And therefore, the community college systems came into being, and the, the community college systems across the country were all searching on how to do it. And uh, it, was, it was a lot of, lot of problems came into it. Uh, because one state would do something. Well, California, they just, you could go to community college for nothing, you know? Uh, for years and years, you could do all of that. And then what happened out there, everybody was going to college to learn how to play tennis and play uh, those types of things, and that's not what they wanted. <laughs> so everybody was going to college to learn how to be, have recreation. Uh, there was no stabilization, there was no, nothing across the border in Kellogg, formed, uh, I think, eight or ten college senior, uh, universities that to teach people how to manage a community college. And that's where I ended up. Uh, so I was a, what, what they call a Kellogg. If you're, if you're into this business, you will find out that I would be a Kellogg fellow. Except that I really wasn't because they ran out of money, but they gave me, they gave me all the Kellogg. They ran out of Kellogg money, and uh, they they wanted me to come there, so I went to Florida State because they were the ones interesting. And there were there were fights at the at the, at the uh, university level about who was going to get the Kellogg money, and the Kellogg money went to Florida State rather than the University of Florida. And this, their, their, the faculty for teaching the potential community college people, uh, we had them were our professors, the ones who had brought Florida State from a women's college into a four-year college. And we had a lot of uh, time with uh, the former president, uh, the director of finance, the director of all of these things, they were the, our faculty. They were the ones who had, who had gone through this. This then leads to the community college in Virginia, and Virginia was a little bit late in getting into it, and there still was no real standardization across the country on what it was, and it became a very interesting situation for us because when we were here, when I was here, got started, uh, the local boards were trying to figure out what they're supposed to do. So the state of Virginia was trying to figure out how to fund you. Now all of these things became totally beyond anything you could guess. Uh, the presidents at that time, we met every month and to, uh, to answer questions, and que very, very simple question. Here's, a, here's, here's one for you, think about it. It's important that at that point in time that the boards from the community colleges all get together and have discussions in trying to figure out how they're going to handle things. Uh, who's going to pay for it? Uh, I can remember specifically because University of uh, watching the, uh, the D.C. area president and then here we are from Dabney 
uh, if we're going to, we, we give the money out based upon your number of students, so therefore, but we both had uh, groups of 10 going to the big meeting. And uh, that required a little discussion because uh, we would be, we would have a couple hundred students and Northern Virginia would have three, four thousand and we would be getting money on the basis of the number of the students. But so we were going to have to take money from the 200 student type of thing to send the press, send the presidents and all of these to meeting. So it became, and it still is, this whole thing is, is not totally clarified yet, but across the country and across the nation, that thing is occurring. And uh, you could be proud of that because we have elevated to a higher, very, a very, you don't realize how high a level they are, how far they are accepted across the board. Uh, and it's, it's probably going to continue. And others are trying to catch up in reality. So that's it. And you got to ask any more questions, I'll be happy to answer. <laughs> Encino Hospital, January the 20th, 1952. And from then on, I started growing. I was born and raised right in Salma, just about a mile up the road. And uh, I graduated from high school. I married my grade school sweetheart. They caught us kissing in the clothes closet when I was 12 and she was 11. <laughs> and uh, graduated from Dabney. She's not here. Pardon? No, she's not here. Graduated from Dabney in 1972, and I was the, uh, I graduated as a forestry technician. And from that point on, I was hired by the then Division of Forestry here in Virginia, the Virginia Division of Forestry, which later became the Virginia Department of Forestry. And through that time, well, I worked for them for 35 years. And uh, I've been retired now about 12. Feels good, feels good. But through those years, Sherry and I, we had three children, uh, two boys and a girl. The girl has four kids. The boys have three kids. So I've got 10 grandkids, seven girls, a oh, whole. <laughs> and three boys, they range from 14 to, uh, to three. Now I could tell you stories on those children immensely, but I'm not going to. But through the years, when I graduated from Dabney, which we affectionately called Cornfield Tech, because at one time, uh, it was a, uh, a farm over there. And I can remember delivering papers the Roanoke Times. I'd get up at four o'clock in the morning, deliver my papers, and during hunting season, I would go over to the farm and I would hunt. And uh, I'd have to ride my bicycle out because I couldn't drive at that time. Uh, but I had some good times at Dabney, uh, met a lot of friends, and of course when I went to Dabney in the forestry program, we did not have the equipment that uh, the college has now. Uh, we had a few chainsaws. The buildings that are over there now certainly weren't over there then. There were two buildings. And our uh, student center was a trailer with vending machines in it. So when we took a break, we'd just go to the vending machines and uh, get our sodas and snacks. But it was a good experience for me, and uh, uh, I thank Dr. Bacchus for all his leadership uh, at Dabney through the years. Uh, I had a good time there. <coughs> now, we'll talk about a little bit about the Masonic. In 1973, I got married and I joined a gospel group and we've been singing ever since. But when Ray Allen acquired the theater for Apple Folks of America, uh, he needed help to get the screens down, the movie screens here in the theater. Well, our group, we came down here, we climbed up ladders, we took down those humongous curtains, we took down the, uh, the, the uh, screens. Uh, but we spent a good time down here with Ray Allen, and I hope he appreciated it. I, I'm assuming he did. <laughs> I know he does. Uh, but one story that Judy wanted me to share. When I was little, my buddy and I would walk 
because mom and daddy would not let me phone. So we'd walk from Selma down to uh, uh, the Masonic to go to the movies every Friday and Saturday night. And was, this was in the wintertime. And my buddy, he raised chickens and pigeons. So we were coming out of Selma on the road. Well, there was a dead owl laying in the road. <laughs> well, C.H. just picks up that owl and sticks it in his pocket. Why, I do not know. <laughs> so we walk down to the movie theater. We, we come into the theater and we always had left one chair beside us empty to throw our coats on. So I'm sitting here and I can show you the exact seat up there in the theater. <laughs> so you've got seat here, empty seat, and CH. About halfway through the movie, I turn around and the owl is sitting up on that seat, <laughs> looking around. He flies off. <laughs> well, about three years later, there was an article in the Daily Review, uh, and Randy Anderson, I think he was the manager or kin to the manager of the, uh, uh, of the Sonic, and there was a picture of him holding this owl that he had captured in the Masonic Theater. <laughs> now this is three years later. And I am sure that that owl lived pretty well in the Masonic Theater, and I have no doubts that it was not the same owl. <laughs> so, anyway, thank y'all. Now this isn't anything about to do with the theater or culture or anything like that, but I was thinking along the lines, maybe she wanted to hear just things that happened in this general area, and that's what this is. Great. So when I was 16 or 17, I had a buddy who was my same age. And he had a thing about going to visit the fire towers. There used to be a lot more in the area than there are now. So there would be a family visit up to my uncle's house on a Sunday at Bowling Springs. I mean, one of the Bowling Springs was my water source. Got a pipe in it and pump. But straight up the mountain to the west was Morning Knob Fire Tower. And if you're Bowling Springs, going toward Paint Bank, look to the right, you see a ridge line and sort of toward the right end of it is a prominent peak. But to the left of it is land that's been logged recently. Well, this time in the 60s, there was a farmhouse up there, a two-story farmhouse near the top of the ridge and several acres cleared around it. It, it really stood out. And uh, the plan was we were going to go to that fire tower. So we're going up the side of the mountain. We end up in a steep hollow. It's got all these little, like, four-foot waterfalls. So, oh, this was in the winter. It's kind of a saving grace. This thing has a surprise in it. And we would just drink out of that little creek whenever we felt like it. In the process of climbing the mountain. And we get up to where we can start seeing the cleared area and so forth, and we're still following the stream, and when we get up to where we can see how good the stream ran, well, there's a couple lived up there, and my uncle bought eggs from all that. Anyway, the stream ran through that fellow's pig pen. <laughs> And it never bothered us. Well, the fault wasn't good, but it never affected us physically. <laughs> like I said, it not, doesn't tie into local history, but it's a story. <laughs>